my presentation today is very much based on my last book on Syria, the making and unmaking of a refuge state, which is uh, when I set out to explore and understand the what I thought was the unique nature of Syria's people. And when I say Syria, I'm talking Biladishan, I'm talking the Levant. This is an area that was always very well known for its local cosmopolitanism. Some people would say local conviviality, whereby some social groups managed to integrate while maintaining their special ethno or ethno-religious character. So in doing so, I'm going to explore the nature of the numerous forced migrations of the 19th and early 20th century into Bilad Sham or greater Syria or the Levant, whichever term you prefer. Um, and I, I came to realize that these migrants or refugees, um, the Ottomans never really decided what to call them. They, these were muhajar, so they were either immigrants or they were refugees. The translation never really makes sense. But for the Ottoman, they contributed really an important element to the making of this sort of modern, culturally plural first empire, but then th this state of Syria. One group, the Circassians, made particular efforts to integrate but keep themselves separate in an effort not to be assimilated. And it's this is the process that I'm calling making um, places in new spaces, which I will explore with you uh, this afternoon. But first I want to go over how I'm going to proceed. So I'm going to go over some definitions first. I'm going to look at the modern history of forced migration. And then I'm going to go back to look at the 19th century um, forced migrations that came out of the numerous wars between the Ottoman and the Russian. Uh, I'll look at the Circassian case and then look at this migrant integration without assimilation, this carrying of your culture, both materially and also in terms of music and dance, et cetera, um, without being assimilated. So you, bear with me if it seems like I'm going off track, but I, I, I'm going to look at the present before I go and look at the past. Um, because what we saw in the past in the 19th and early 20th century was a time when there were there were borders, there were frontiers, but they were fuzzy and movement was rarely restricted within this imperial, in this empire. However, there was a counter movement going on and that was the development of the nation state, which was coming out of Europe and resulted in conflict and mass forced migration, ethnic cleansing, ethnic genocide, and the homogenizing of the subject of the new states. So. I will, I, I'm going to go to the past, then I'll look at the Ottoman response um, and how they managed to, uh, to, to deal with these huge numbers of people, how they organized the mass influx. Um, and that will bring me to the Circassian, uh, Trans-Caucasian peoples uh, forced migrations. And what I'm going to get to in the end is that it was the combination of the Ottoman legacy of the first modern refugee code as well as the vestiges of the millet system during the reform period, the Tanzimat of the Ottomans, um, and also people's very strong desire to make home-like places, but in new physical places. So knowing that my time is somewhat short, I'm gonna run through these ideas of who is a forced, migra who is a forced migrant. You know, uh, all societies create sort of descriptive frames and categories and typologies. It's how we organize ourselves and our surroundings. And today in this day and age, we, we read about forced migrants, we read about economic migrants, we read about labor migrants. And actually we've begun not to be able to make much of a distinction between forced and voluntary uh, immigration. So uh, who's a refugee? Well, who's a forced migrant? I don't know that it really matters, but there are two definitions that exist within the international system. There is the, um, uh, the definition which uh, has been approved by the General Assembly of the United Nations. Um, it's a legal definition which sees a refugee as a person who, is, who owing to a well-founded fear of being persecuted for reasons of race, religion, opinion, uh, is outside of the country of his nationality 
and is unable to, or owing to such fear, is unwilling to avail himself or herself of the protection of that state. And obviously, for Palestinians, there's a second definition, which is not actually a legal definition, but it's an operational definition, which defines a Palestinian refugee as a person whose normal place of residence was Palestine during the period 1st of June 1945 to 15th of May 1948, and who lost both home and means of livelihood as a result of the 1948 conflict. Now, the modern history of um, this sort of refugee regime, if I can put it that way, has five phases. I'm going to run through them very quickly because having done that, then you'll see what was so special about what happened in the 19th and early 20th century during the late period of the Ottoman Empire. I'm not an apologist for the Ottoman Empire, but I think it has not been given credit for what it did much earlier on, even if many of its acts were instrumental. Um, it was, I believe, far superior than some of these phases that we saw taking place. So the first phase of uh, what, what's often called the modern refugee regime was uh, put into effect at the end of World War I, when the League of Nations was set up and Friedhold Nansen, a, um, uh, a Nordic explorer, um, was uh, named the first High Commissioner of Refugees. He recognized that there was a real problem now in Europe, in all these nation states, uh, in that there were a large number of, in the first instant, white Russians who had fought, fought against the Bolsheviks um, and had been stripped of their nationality by Lenin in 1921, who were unable to move, they were unable to travel um, because they had no papers. And so uh, this first phase was basically about issuing travel documents to allow these people who couldn't return to their original homeland um, to be able to travel within Europe to go and find work in order to support their family and then to be able to come back. So it was that first concept that um, uh, a forced migrant, a refugee really would be turned into an economic migrant in order to be able to provide for their family. So that that was really what, what I'm going to call um, uh, the, the first phase. Um, these same passports were later on uh, issued also to Armenians uh, in the 1920s and also to Assyrians uh, fleeing their various uh, genocides uh, in the 1920s and 1930s. So that was the, the first phase. Uh, the second phase obviously came along in uh, uh, as a result of uh, World War II uh, when um, at the end of that war, there were more than 40 million European refugees uh, being looked after by the United Nations, which had been just created a couple of years before to provide them with aid. Um, there were about 7 million refugees, uh, then commonly referred to as displaced persons or DPs, um, who some of them were willing to return to their country of origin now that the fighting had stopped, uh, but there were about a million who refused to go back and preferred to be resettled elsewhere. Um, this was now the case where refugees came to be separated from economic migrants. So if you could be declared a refugee, you could be protected by international law from being returned to your country, uh, and you were given certain rights uh, over time in the new places that you found yourselves in. One of the most important outcomes of though the, this uh, second period was the um, development of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And I just remind you, Article 13 was the that everyone has the right to freedom of movement and residence within the borders of each state, and that everyone has the right to seek and to enjoy in other countries asylum from persecution. Um, the third phase, uh, which then came into effect in the 1960s, as we entered the Cold War and the post-colonial era, this was now an era of armed conflict, mass forced migration, but it was largely in Africa, in the former British, French, and Belgian colonies. But in Europe, it was the Cold War. And as the Cold War became hot and the Iron Curtain came down between East and West Europe, um, there were certain checkpoints. This is Checkpoint Charlie, but there were certain other checkpoints. Um, many refugees from behind the Iron Curtain were largely welcomed and seen as heroic when they escaped from communism to the capitalistic system. Uh, 
So this third phase was really quite interesting. It was also the period of time when the United Nations, the, the UN Commission, Com High Commission for Refugees issued its protocol, which ended the geographic and temporal restrictions to the original convention, which had only been for refugees uh, from World War II uh, and also from within Europe. The fourth phase was a very dangerous phase. This was largely in the 1990s. Um, and this was as the Cold War ended. There were now many small wars, new wars, proxy wars in fragile states, such as Somalia, emergencies of, of great complexity. Um, this was a new type of um, uh, forced migrant. We called them often many hued refugees, no longer fleeing necessarily of armed conflict, but sometimes fleeing a political system, searching for safety, family reunification, and security. And this, some of you will recognize, is an image from Sarajevo in 1992 with state security trying to protect civilians um, directly from non-state actors. So the fifth phase, and I think we were still in this phase, was uh, the fortress Europe. Uh, this is the fortress mentality. This is where there were attempts to redefine what is a, a refugee, what is asylum, what is the migration, how do we manage migration, how do we uh, keep people out. And here's where instead of welcoming the refugee because they were fleeing a system um, that was uh, antithetical to the, uh, Europe, um, there was a rise of antipathy to the forced migrant, even when fleeing armed conflicts that targeted civilians. So it was a period of confusion, it still is, and distortions, especially in terms of distinction between migrants and refugees. And there was this nationalist, keep them out populist discourse that distorted the contributions that refugees and migrants make to developed economies, and also uh, uh, to turn to discourses of security. Uh, victims of armed conflict now were often seen as security risks, a period of setting up border patrols, open sea operations that were not so much to save people, but to push them back. So I think all of you are aware uh, that, of course, uh, there's a very heavy burden in the Eastern Mediterranean and in the Southern Mediterranean. And I just give you an idea of some of these numbers because they are really huge. Uh, UNHCR says that about 26% of the world's refugees are hosted in the Middle East and North Africa. But when you add Palestinian numbers, you're looking more at 40% of the world's refugees. So where did this all begin? And how was it managed in the recent past? So let's look at the, the forced migration in the Middle East during the 19th century. Um, when you had in Europe, the political project to create homogeneous nation states and colonial endeavors, um, but you had the empire. So the darker shades here actually represent the Ottoman Empire uh, in the 19th century. Um, and during this period, during these hundred years, Imperial Russia and the Ottoman Empire fought six wars. All of these, all of these wars but one were uh, related to expansionist efforts on the part of Imperial Russia. Uh, and during these six wars, the borders of the Ottoman Empire were chipped away at, uh, thanks to um, a great deal of work by Catherine the Great at the end of the 18th century, early 19th century. By uh, 1832, Greece uh, became, you could say, a client of Russia and Great Britain, followed by Bulgaria in 1878, Serbia as well, Montenegro, uh, and then uh, Crete and Macedonia in the beginning of the 20th century. What you had with all of these new modern states being created was a massive flight of Muslims, basically, but also many Jews to the remaining Southern Ottoman empires. These forced migrants were all members of the Ottoman millet. There were three main millets, as some of you know. There was the Muslim millet, which included Arabs, Kurds, Albanians, Turks, Kosovars. So the millet, the belonging to the millet was on the basis of religion, not on ethnicity. The Christian millet then included Arabs, Greeks, Armenians, Serbians, Bulgarians. And there was, of course, the Jewish millet, which included Sephardic, Ashkenazi, and Arab Jews. So belonging in the empire then was not based on your physical place of birth um, or even the ethno, the, but rather 
the it specifically included the social community, the sort of religious community, the millet uh, that you belong to. So these social communities with their religious hierarchies were dispersed throughout the empire. They were not in one particular place. So it's important to recognize this kind of horizontal sense of belonging. So the members of the, of the Christian millet were dispersed throughout the Ottoman Empire. And that was a key then for the forced migrants. Then later on, when they moved, they could always find others who belonged to their same millet um, as they uh, were forced uh, into the uh, southern provinces of the Ottoman Empire. Now, I want to talk about the, the the one war that the Ottomans won. This is the Crimean War of 1853 to 1856. Um, it was fought over, I mean, I'm not trying to um, minimize its impact, but I do sometimes say that it was actually a war that was fought over who had the right to the keys of the Church of the Holy Sepulcher in Jerusalem. Um, what had happened is that France had decided that it wanted the keys back because they had been awarded the keys, so to speak. They had been awarded the right to look after Catholics in the Holy City. Um, but over time, Russian monks had sort of moved in. So the Eastern Orthodoxy had begun to take over the managing of the churches in Jerusalem. And um, that was Napoleon III. The Sultan agreed that he should have the keys, but Nicholas I of Russia was outraged. And so he invaded the Danube provinces of the Ottoman Empire. He sank much of the Ottoman fleet in the Black Sea and insisted um, uh, on moving then to take over Constantinople. So Britain and France were um, very worried that this might be the collapse of the Ottoman Empire. And so they fought alongside the Ottomans. And those of you who know English literature know about the Charge of the Light Brigade by Laura Tennyson. Um, and uh, uh, over time, people remembered the, the Charge of the Light Brigade, the Battle of Balaclava. They, they remember how Russian surgeons became uh, perfected the art of amputation, how Florence Nightingale, uh, you know, pioneered modern nursing, but they forgot that this war resulted in the first million forced migrants seeking asylum in the Ottoman Empire between 1854 and 1855, and these were the half million Muslim Tatars from Crimea, plus another 500,000, half a million Cossacks, which would be Georgians and Ukrainians. So, this is the site of the uh, Crimean War of uh, the 1850s. Uh, it seems that we're kind of fighting similar wars with similar opponents. Um, so this is where we had the first really large flow. I'll show you another map. Um, at the end of this war, the Treaty of Paris resulted in 1856, which resulted in Russia being banned from maintaining a fleet on the Black Sea but in return, the Russians insisted that the Muslims of Crimea, these are the Tatars, had to leave. And they were actually given three months to sell up their property and to leave, and as they did, and they then migrated uh, basically into the Balkans at that point. A couple of years later, you had uh, another uh, huge migration. This was in 1860, and this was the defeat of Sheikh Shamil uh, Daghestani uh, by the Russians. So the Russians were able to push down and take over uh, Daghestan. So Sheikh Shamil was basically the spiritual leader of Caucasian resistance to Imperial Russia. He was also the third Imam of the Caucasian Imamate and the Sheikh of the Naqshbandi Tariqa. So with the combination of the Crimean War and Sheikh Shamil's defeat, you had now another half a million, two million forced migrants moving out of the Caucasus. Um, all right, so let me say a little bit about these uh, Circassian forced migrants. And part of the reason I want to focus on them is that so much of what the Ottomans now did related to this big movement uh, from the Transcaucasus. The um, Circassians were mythologized in terms of national character, the military prowess of Circassian men. Uh, they often became an important fighting force for Ottoman militias, uh, you know, up to actually World War I. The Russians demanded that they had to be moved away from any border that was shared with Russia. One. 
the women, the beauty of the women uh, was uh, um, not only something that, that they themselves uh, uh, were very keen to underscore, but Europeans starting from Voltaire and Lord Byron and others uh, often, often talked about the beauty of these women. Uh, we also know that families often sold or gave their uh, beautiful daughters uh, to the seraglio of the sultan uh, in Constantinople, and uh, or they served as, and then they often were given as gifts to other rulers to cement relations with the Ottoman Empire. We know, for example, that in the Hijaz, the Sharif of Mecca's mother, Sharif Hussein, his mother was a Caucasian woman, a gift from the Sultan uh, in Constantinople, and the same also for one of the many wives of the Sultan of Oman, Sayyid Said bin Sultan um, in Oman and Zanzibar. Now, let me say a little bit more. We're going to get now into some of this materiality that I know that you're all interested in. During this period, Europe was very, was absolutely fascinated with Circassians, the beauty of the women, the military prowess, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm just going to show you here a particular a painting. Um, it's actually been given several different names. Uh, sometimes it's called the Circassian Cavalry awaiting their commanding officer at the door of a Byzantine monument. Uh, sometimes it's just called a group of irregular cavalry at the door of a mosque in Asia Minor. Um, Byzantine monument, mosque, not, not really very, very clear. Um, the artist here had joined the entourage of the French plen uh, plenipotentiary to Persia, traveled with him uh, for two years throughout Northern Persia, Armenia, and then to the, the uh, rim of the Black Sea. And he was really very interested in the architectural accessories. Um, you, know, you see here the fine horses, the, the weapons, the trappings, uh, the kiosks. Um, very interested in, I'm going to say, the, the, the orientalized scenes, um, sometimes against a fiery sky, but um, rather taken by the, the, the finery, uh, the grace and the subtlety of, of what he thought he saw. So here we have one to two million Circassians, uh, Dagestani, Chechenian, uh, entering the Ottoman Empire and the sublime porch in, in Constantinople, um, wondering what to do. What's interesting is they, the initial reaction of the Ottomans was not how do we stop all of these people from coming, but rather how do we integrate and resettle these numbers in the most beneficial way for the empire? How do we use them to develop our underpopulated areas and even our more insecure areas because of the military prowess? And it was decided to try and persuade them to move into Anatolia and into the southern provinces of Bilad Shah. So the Ottomans took a decentralized approach after the initial emergency phase when they, they descended on Constantinople and other places, they dispersed them as quickly as possible. And their policy was to integrate but not assimilate because the empire wanted to remain a multicultural empire. Um, this of course appealed very much to these uh, Transcaucasian forced migrants. So in 1857, the Ottomans launched the immigrant code and this was a specific code for immigrant families who, who, had, who, who came with nothing to be given plots of state land. And along with that, to be exempted for taxation, as well as to be exempted from, for conscription into the army for either six years if they settled in the Balkan, in, the, in Romali, or for 12 years if they moved on into Anatolia and to Syria. The only obligation they had to make is that they would not sell or leave this land for 20 years. Um, this uh, refugee immigrant code was widely published, so much so that there was a very uh, large response from people in Hungary, from Bohemia, from Poland, from Switzerland, from Italy, and even from North America uh, to have some of this land. So some were coming as immigrants and some were obviously forced migrants. So, this forced migration of the 1860 was particularly difficult. So there are a couple of images here, actually a photograph also because the ox cart uh, was symbolic of the Circassians. Um, 
And it's quite interesting because in the 1860s, uh, we know that the Circassian tribal leaders wrote a letter appealing to the Sultan in Constantinople, uh, post the Crimean War, asking for recognition of their independence, first because they saw themselves as important slave traders to the empire, and second because of their allegiance to Islam, especially under the leadership of Sheikh Shamel. So they were asking first to be treated as um, uh, independent, and then they were also asking for, for ships in order to be able to be moved on to um, areas that would be safe for them. So by between the 1860s and the 1880s, the Ottoman Empire, you could say, got its act together and began uh, moving the Circassians, the Chechens, the Dagestani, um, uh, taking advantage of their military might, so to speak, and moving them to uh, settle in the area which is called the Marmora in Arabic. It's an area between agriculture and pasture land, often contested between Bedouin sheep and camel herders and those who are farming. And they were able to persuade the Circassians to basically build their, their settlements in this strip of land um, to the east of Aleppo, Hama, Homs, Damascus, Haran, Jolan, down into uh, what uh, later on became known as, as Amman. So they were also, uh, th these villages were dispersed. The Ottomans didn't want to see a colony starting to be created. And um, they uh, very, very quickly uh, became a kind of barrier between local enemy groups, uh, between, for example, the Bedouin and the Kurds or the Druze and the Kurds, etc. And eventually they won the respect of the local population. So with the success of this particular code, the Ottomans then moved on and they then developed the general administration for immigration. Um, it was even in 20th century terms, a fairly liberal, generous and open approach to dealing with forced migrants. So economically, they, uh, they used uh, the Circassians to repopulate underpopulated agricultural areas to create a uh, tax farm surplus. Politically, they were using them to defend uh, frontiers. Um, many of the Circassians uh, then uh, uh, became part of the Ottoman army. And not only Circassians, but also Poles and Hungarians um, who came into the area. And environmentally, interestingly enough, they were used to drain the swamps, particularly those around Alexandretta and Antioch, and also in certain areas of, of Palestine to drain the malarial areas so they could have more um, zones for tax farming. Um, many of the historians who've looked at this period have said that this was probably the first instance of direct, prolonged, and rational state social planning in the Muslim world, and probably the first of its kind in the world to regulate immigration and to devise a settlement policy. Unfortunately, that wasn't the only forced migration. There was then a really significant second migration of Circassians uh, in the 1870s. This was the last of the Ottoman um, uh, Russian wars of 1877-78. And another one to two million Circassians and Chechens were forced to move. And those who had been settled in the Balkans were now forced to move again, but this time into Anatolia and um, into uh, the area of Bilad Sham. Obviously, um, uh, some Circassians and some Chechens uh, weren't happy in the terms, in the land that they got, in the amount of help that they had in their first one or two years of, of uh, being settled. And many of them petitioned uh, Imperial Russia to return. So it's not all a rosy picture. You know, Some didn't find it uh, uh, that appealing uh, to be in these underpopulated areas. But um, as a result of this last war, uh, the commission was renamed. It became a general administration for religious affairs. Um, it located land for resettlement. It transported the immigrants to these lands. It sometimes gave them housing, gave them seeds, sometimes gave them uh, winter supplies uh, and a monthly income for that first year. It was, it was generally um, a very liberal policy. And the Ottomans used the Muslim principles of aiding migrants by charging the native 
communities um, to accept the immigrants as brothers. Uh, there's one document I saw in Damascus, each head of household in Damascus was charged one piaster. In today's terms, it's about $10 to assist refugees and immigrants to settle uh, in the local area. So with the Circassians, they became now subjects of the empire. They entered a largely Muslim empire and they were Muslims themselves. Um, so integration rather than assimilation meant that they had to carefully construct their social distinctiveness in these new physical spaces. And they did this through language, through dress, through architecture, through technology, and through materiality. They very carefully constructed this distinct distinctiveness, uh, particularly in language, which they maintained, and in architectural forms, especially in their homes and their mosques, because they needed to distinguish themselves from the other Muslim groups around them, because they all belonged to the same Muslim millet. So let me just show you now a few images. On the right, this is uh, Caucasia, the Transcaucasus. Um, and you had not only those who, who fled uh, in the 1880s, but they started to continue to flee in the 1890s and, in, and even into the beginning of the 20th century, where you began to have some of the Abaza, the uh, Abkhaz, uh, the Kabardai, uh, the, the Shapsug, these different Transcaucasian groups were unwilling to live under Russian Orthodoxy or they were fearful of forced conversion. So the numbers kept on, kept on coming to the point where there were about 3 million who were entering the Balkans and then the Southern Arab provinces by the 1880s. And they were looking for land that looked like the Caucasia, uh, Circassia, and which is why one of the largest settlements in, in this area of the Jolan. Um, you might say it doesn't look exactly like, but if you're looking for a mountainous area, that's about the closest you could get. Along with this, the Sublime Port encouraged the uh, Circassians and others that they were free to express their faith, to build their own places of worship, and to construct their homes in any style that they wished. And I'll, I'll come back to this point uh, in, in just a minute. So, I wanted to quote, uh, while you look at some of these architectural features, from some of the travelers who went through um, you know, this area of Bilad Sham in the 1890s. And I just quote from Schumacher, who says, it does one's eyes good after having seen so many devastated places to arrive at a flourishing, evenly constructed, clean village, having more the feeling for European systems than the citizens of many towns in this country. Uh, the same kind of language is used by another traveler, Freer in 1905, who says, these people do not use camels and the ass for transport, but rather they use the ox cart. They are unafraid of attracting attention by successful crops, as at present they pay no taxes and their villages are known for their red tiled pitch roofs. So here um, are some examples of the places of, wor of worship. So there's uh, I, one mosque here I've shown you uh, in uh, Managlia and Romania, uh, compared to another mosque in uh, Kafarkama in Israel. And in the lower picture is a, uh, a cathedral in Ani in Turkey, which goes back a thousand years. Um, uh, in fact, the same architect later went back to Constantinople to work on the Hagia Sophia. This was completed as a cathedral in the year 1001. Uh, it was a church. Uh, then it was converted uh, into a mosque. And then later it was reconsecrated as a church under the Georgian dominion. So you have a particular style uh, and you have this uh, pitched roof. Um, which uh, was very important in the Transcaucasus. And here are a couple of other. This is now a, uh, a mosque in Wadi Sir in Jordan. You have this red tiled roof. Uh, another one here, similar structure of Rehania in Israel. And I realized I didn't, um, I didn't put in an image of what a lot of the mosques look like in the region. Uh, so I, I just found this uh, painting of the Takia in, um, in Damascus, which shows you, of course, this was built by Sinan Pasha. So this is actually a 16th 
um, century, but this is a very different style uh, from the style that the Circassians used. Uh, this is an example of the homes that they built. So here is a, a tiled roof uh, in Turkey. Here's another tiled roof uh, in Syria. Again, very different from local constructions uh, because this is the way in which um, the Circassian as belonging to the main Muslim millet could maintain their distinctiveness so that they didn't assimilate, but they could integrate and express and make home uh, in these new physical spaces. Um, it's the same with the military. Uh, you have an image here of a, of a, a, a Circassian uh, militia uh, in the 1880s. Uh, and of course, they were renowned as fighters in the Balkans and then later in, in the Arabian uh, provinces. Um, and after, um, this is also an image of some of the Circassian groups uh, that uh, fought with the Ottomans uh, against Allenby um, in World War I. Um, of course, at the close of World War I with the defeat, many Circassians decided they didn't want to be moved again. So they just took off their uniforms and stayed put. Um, two forced migrations in 50 years was enough of them. Um, but as a group, the Circassians then offered their services to the new Emir of uh, Transjordan, Emir Abdullah. This relationship has remained. So I, uh, I show you an image of Emir Abdullah. This was taken in the early 1950s. Uh, and on the uh, left-hand side of the image, you see the Circassian Royal Guard. Uh, on the right-hand side, you see the part of the, the Arab le Legion. Um, so you had Circassians and Arab Bedouin uh, then uh, also becoming uh, important elements in maintaining the security of the new Hashemite uh, kingdom. So Circassians, the Adigai, succeeded in integrating in the Levant by carrying their culture on their backs in ox carts on ships and by reestablishing their communities and stressing their differences wherever they could. They were Muslim as were the main uh, population where they settled and hence their mosques retained the unique square boxy early Byzantine look with its red tiled roofs. They are a social center of life. Um, they felt really couldn't be the mosque because anybody can enter a mosque, but they created their own charitable associations rather than the mosque where they were able to preserve their language uh, and they preserved many of their customs. The Habze, the extreme conservatism, the hierarchy in the family and tribes in terms of gender roles, uh, and they maintained the, the, the ethnic character, the military prowess and mythology uh, orientalization of the beauty of their women. Furthermore, particularly in Jordan, they, this integration without assimilation was also represented in the elaboration of differences through symbols, such as this is the flag of the 12 Circassian tribes. Um, and this is adopted from the Adagai flag of the Circassian imamate of 1834. So this was a non-Arab Muslim tribal group in Jordan, which now is coalesced and has representation in the Jordanian parliament. Uh, originally, of course, having come from the Caucasus of Western Asia. Um, so the 12 uh, stars on the Circassian flag symbolize the individual tribes of the Circassians. The nine stars within the Ark symbolize the nine aristocratic tribes of the Adagai and the three horizontal um, uh, spears symbolize the three democratic tribes. Uh, so altogether, uh, I can't even pronounce all the names, but uh, uh, as I said, some of them are the Shapsug, the, the Kabardai, the Termogoy, the Ubiuk, uh, the, the Abdak, many, many others. Uh, those of you who are of Circassian origin, you can probably pronounce these words much better than me and come in uh, with some comments um, uh, when we finish. And I'm going to now just kind of close because the Circassians were really very, very interesting. They carried their social places with them. They carried their culture with them over 40 years of forced migration over two, and two different places. They joined the majority religious social group of Muslims in the Levant. Um, 
and they were able then to actually maintain their difference so as not to assimilate. So their homeland, their social places were uh, re-established in new physical places. And unlike other migrant groups, the Circassians have maintained their social identity for over 150 years into the fourth and fifth generation. So there's a social imaginary in architecture, in materiality, in dress, uh, in technology, meaning the ox cart. And I should also say that Circassians were uh, deeply involved in the development of the region. They were often employed along with, uh, with the Arnaut, the uh, Albanian, and the Kosovar in building the Hijaz railway, in draining swamps. Uh, they also had amazing linguistic flexibility, moving between the Cyrillic alphabet to the Arabic alphabet, and then the Roman script. Uh, their charitable associations were much more than that. They were particularly important. Uh, but of course, there were ruptures. The imagined homeland, when after the collapse of the Soviet Union, and many of them were able to return, wasn't quite what they expected. Um, there are some very interesting uh, uh, studies made on the shock that they felt when they uh, met people who were meant to be Circassian relatives and realized that they didn't look as they were supposed to look. They weren't as tall or as fair as they were supposed to be. Um, they were also far more conservative in their understanding of Islam than their uh, people around them. Um, but basically the homeland of Circassia, the materiality of the Caucasus um, was less defined in the past uh, than as it has been now, particularly in uh, ceremonial dance and dress for men and for women. So I'm going to stop here. I've given myself a little bit of extra time uh, to be able to take some questions or comments um, from, from you and we'll see where that takes us. So meanwhile, thank you very much for this amazing lecture. Um, it was really, really, uh, um, really pleasant to watch and to listen to. Meanwhile, I hope that uh, in the audience, that the audience is not, is not too shy tonight. <laughs> But uh, while they warm up, uh, I would like um, I would like to like uh, ask you a couple of things. Uh, the first one uh, it was about uh, it's it's uh, it is a question about how to project uh, uh, this part of history into the future, and if you see some takeaways. Uh, from the way the Ottoman Empire managed uh, refugees uh, uh, and uh, the way they, in particular, they meant citizenship, actually. Uh, and if this can, can give us some ingredients, perhaps to revise today, today's understanding of nation state and the limitation that the way of thinking about citizenship in, in, in these terms gives. So that would be my first question. Well, in an ideal world, I think we would get rid of the nation state. <laughs> uh, certainly, I think the, 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 the kind of frontier mentality, uh, us and them, um, is very dangerous. You know, I, of course, um, all political systems have their faults, but in some ways, you know, when the Ottoman Empire uh, in the 1870s, um, Medhat Basha, which uh, is very well known in Damascus, is a street, you know, Shere Medhat Basha is uh, very important because of all of the modernization efforts that he made. He wrote the first constitution that we have. I mean, long before there were constitutions even in Europe, um, which he tried uh, to put in place. Um, there was a parliament and his idea was that we should move, that the Ottomans should move towards a federated state. Uh, because now there were numerous uh, millets. There were, you know, there was a, a Catholic millet, a Jewish, several Jewish millets, several different Catholic millets, etc. Um, but he, it was too late. He was undermined uh, by uh, the kind of nationalism that was already emerging. Uh, so many of the 
particularly the, the Greek Orthodox, uh, preferred to, to join Greece rather than stay in a federated uh, state, which was a pity. I mean, it, it's almost as though if the reforms had started 50 years earlier, we might have had a federated state. Um, and incidentally, you know, Mehmet Basha was from Bulgaria. You know, you know, people always say, "Oh, where was he from?" I say, "Well, this was the nature of empire." You know, so that you, um, the 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 Ottoman, um, who became educated or who became part of government, came from all of the empire. It was not just a simple uh, elite uh, in one area. So, you know, it's one of the problems. I mean, I think some of the things that I've mentioned about the Ottoman Empire, maybe you could even say about the Austro-Hungarian. There was much greater freedom of movement. Uh, through, throughout that region. And of course, it was a very plural society as well. Um, uh, but you know, uh, you know, and maybe this will take us to some of the issues about the Ukraine, but basically the Imperial Russia was always the problem. <laughs> and it's still the problem. Do you know what I mean? Although maybe Imperial Russia is pushing the West now to start thinking differently about people crossing borders, uh, about um, recognizing that when people are forced migrants, what they need to do is they need to be able to work in order to then to provide remittances. So that I'm not saying that we need to get rid of the 1951 convention, but the 51 convention removed the, the notion of work and therefore agency from the individual who has lost the protection of their own state. Whereas that's not how the Ottomans looked at it. Basically the Ottomans said, if you come here, as long as you respect our laws and you, you, know, um, you become a law abiding citizen of the, of the Vatan, then keep your religion, you know, move where you want within reason. I mean, I, I think that, um, first of all, the Circassians were quite happy to move to the areas that were being suggested to them. Um, uh, but uh, they, this is a period when, for example, almost all of the, the Jews of Europe and of Bulgaria in particular, and Serbia who were being forced into the region, they basically all went to Jerusalem. So the population in Jerusalem exploded, so to speak, uh, with the, the Jewish population um, that came in. Um, at a certain point, the Ottomans began to be really nervous about this and began saying, no, 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 we need to have you all spread out because they were promoting a kind of cosmopolitanism that we're all others amongst others. And I think in the 21st century, we have to come back to, or we have to move forward to that kind of understanding that it's a global world, but it's also local. And we've got to find ways of recognizing that there's no place for xenophobia um, and the kind of populist national discourses that we're seeing in Europe to be able to continue. Um, yeah, so, you know, I'm, uh, of course, the Ottoman Empire um, it made a lot of, there were a lot of mistakes. Uh, there are a lot of Arabs who feel they were badly treated by the Ottomans. Um, and uh, there were a lot of Ottomans who looked down on Arabs, so to speak. But when you look at it as a whole and compare it to the way um, the European colonialists mentality was being created during this time, uh, they were far more sophisticated and far more liberal and, uh, and forward thinking than Europe. Uh, and I would like, you know, I'd like to see that somehow inform the future. I think from our end, we do hope the very same. We, we strongly agree with what you said. I, was, I would like to invite uh, our audience to raise some hands and make some questions. Yeah, so we have Razan Khalaf from Amman, actually. Okay. So. Yes. Hi, everyone. Um, very pleased to be among you all. I really enjoyed the lecture. I'm speaking from Amman, but uh, we'll have to apologize for not being camera material at this point. <laughs> it's Friday evening. So uh, what I want, it was really interesting to listen about all of that after going through a two year venture uh, research on Amman. And uh, when the whole lecture was published, I was thinking Amman must feature there because this is really an integral part of Amman's story, uh, the Circassian immigration and everything. But I was also, um, so we're trying to cover 
all social groups and through that research because we're collecting narratives and Amman is a diverse place, although not quite uh, advertised as such. But um, in a while back, we met with an Armenian, uh, an Armenian citizen of Jordan also. We've uh, toured with many Circassians and we've seen their material heritage here. And one thing that really struck me, and I had to ask a question, I mean, among other researchers was, what was the difference, you know, between Armenians and also Circassians being so well received also in the region and Amman in particular, maybe, I don't know much about uh, the rest of the, of the Levant, but um, versus the Palestinian uh, case in 1948 and um, later on. And um, a colleague of mine mentioned something about the saturation and how, how saturated was the area, which I think is, is, is very important. I mean, if, if the Ottoman Empire, there's saturation and there's also the urban rural divide. Um, Circassians basically established city refugees that the influx of refugees that later come into well-established cities and the reception into rural okay it says my connection is unstable yeah uh, so reception into rural and urban areas I think would be so much different uh, you know in in terms of even state policies and uh, and such um, yeah that was a comment from my man yeah. Thank you. No, I, I, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, it's why I, I prefer not to talk just about Syria, but uh, you know, Bilal Sham, because the Circassians were, um, because of the directives and the the actual um, uh, commissions that were helping, the Circassians were very well received. You know, there are settlements from, well, the settlement in Ras Al Ain was actually a Chechenian settlement in a malarial area. They wouldn't listen. And there was something very hard headed about, um, about the Chechenians. And so that, that community never really thrived. Um, but almost all the other communities, all the way down, I mean, particularly the, the community in, in, uh, around, uh, all around Damascus, uh, in the Ruta of Damascus, in Jolan, and uh, in the area that became Amman, because when the first when they first arrived in the 1860s, 1870s, uh, they were some of them were uh, first were camping out in the ruins of the ancient Philadelphia, um, and when they first came, they came they had to transform themselves into farmers, uh, except for those who were able to to join the Ottoman um, army and later on the gendarmerie that was established. Uh, um, it was the same for the Armenians. The Armenians were, uh, were many of them were rescued from the death marches, from the genocide, uh, particularly uh, around Aleppo uh, in Raqqa, uh, trying to you know, help them before they reached Deir Azur where the, where the next big genocide happened. But also they came down to Damascus, they came to Beirut and they, they, they were only in tents for a few weeks, they were dispersed because this was the Ottoman policy, which of course is a public health issue. Uh, at that time, there was terrible fear of the spread of smallpox, typhoid, typhus, um, and so uh, they were. The, their aim was disperse and then give them a way to have a livelihood. So, for the uh, many Armenians also made it came to uh, to Jerusalem. They came to Salt. Then they by then Amman by the 1920s Amman. Uh, it was actually beginning to be the, the major center of the capital. For Palestinians, you're right, but you have to remember the era because we're looking at the Ottoman era. We're also looking at the mandate period. And the mandate period, the, both the British and the French mandatories or colonial powers, if you want to put it that way, um, were prepared to receive these refugee, uh, these forced migrants, um, um, to make up for the, the huge losses of life of World War I. So they were, they were accepted, they were given citizenship within five years of arriving. Um, and the Circassians and the Armenians, particularly in the mandate period, many of them worked in the gendarmerie. Um, and in fact, the British did the same in Iraq, which, which is why when the British returned their mandate in 1932 to the League of Nations, they abandoned the basically the the levies the Assyrian levies 
who were then, uh, of course, very unpopular with the rest of the Iraqi population. For Palestinians, you know, it's a different world order. It's, um, you know, you're, you're looking at a, a European settler, settler project that was supported by Great Britain. You know, Avi Schleim likes to start from 1817, but I prefer to go back really to the 1880s. Um, the Arab states who had only just become independent themselves, you know, Lebanon only became independent in 1943, Syria 1946, uh, Transjordan was still very much um, controlled by Great Britain. Um, the, the, you know, the international law at the time was that when fighting stops, people, civilians can go back to their homes. They weren't able to deal with um, the fact that they could never return. And you have to look back at the reception of Palestinians in the first one or two years, because that was like the reception to Syrians in the first, you know, between um, uh, 2012, 2014 in the neighboring countries. It was, it's just gonna be temporary and you're gonna go back, right? And then of course they discovered that within two years, uh, this new state of Israel, uh, in 1950, 1952, had passed completely new laws about nationality, a completely new law of the right of return, only applied to Jews, couldn't apply to the indigenous community. So, you know, of course, over time, yes, you can say that um, it was not a good, it was not, in the long term, it was not a good reception um, because uh, the Arab states wanted to see Palestinians be able to return to Palestine. Well, and that's still what we're negotiating, uh, whether that comes through or not. Um, so, you know, the political context did change over time, but initially it was quite liberal. It was quite open and quite accepting of these forced migrant groups, I would say until the end of the League of Nations um, and then with the Palestinian crisis. Uh, rumbling on now for more than 70 years, who knows how that's going to end. But very good question, very good comment. Thank you very much. I think we have another question from the floor from Dino Kadic. Hi, thank you so much, um, Don, for the talk and for Kuma hosting. Um, I was wondering if you could just speak a little bit to the relationship between um, the this kind of Ottoman model of refugees and the Ottoman production of refugees, right? Like the late Ottoman genocides. Um, and if there are points at which these two ideas intersect or fight each other or figures that you think embody that relationship. Thanks. Yeah, it, I mean, it, it's a tough one, you know, because the, the, late, um, the late Ottoman period, we're talking about World War One, okay? So although having said that, um, what you have to keep in mind is that, uh, I'll, I'll take as an example, uh, the area uh, that geographically and um, uh, in, in the political imagination, uh, you know, using um, Benedict Anderson, uh, that is Armenia, overlapped hugely with the ideas and the terrain of what is Kurdistan. Uh, to begin with, and also the Assyrian homeland of the Hakkari Mountains. So you have to keep in mind that throughout the 18... Um, okay. Uh, first, the Armenian millet, after the creation of the Kingdom of Greece, was considered the most highly respected millet of the Ottoman Empire, and Armenians basically filled all the positions that had been taken up by the Greek Orthodox. They were extremely important in the foreign ministry because of their education, their language, especially French, et cetera, et cetera. So something changed. What changed? As you were getting huge number of Muslim forced migrants being thrown out of the Transcaucasus uh, and coming in from the Balkans into these areas of Eastern Anatolia, you were getting Muslim refugees uh, really not getting on with the Christian, um, with the Armenian and the Assyrian. Uh, so it, these areas became areas of huge conflict to begin with. Um, so you have um, the beginning of 
uh, massacres in the 1890s in these areas of Armenia, where you have a lot of Muslims coming in, the, demo the demography changing. So there were numerous um, massacres taking place in Eastern uh, Armenia. Um, but many Armenians left at that time. They went to Jerusalem, they went to um, Karak, they went to Cairo, to, they went to Heliopolis, because they could move throughout the empire. They had their millet dispersed throughout the empire. When you get to World War I, you're, also, you're looking at also what happens in war. Um, and I, you know, I'm not a military historian, but I, I would direct you to uh, the work of Eugene Rogan, um, who has shown that, of course, um, the Armenians were very late to develop their ideas of nationalism, but they also, many Armenians sided with the Russians, uh, thinking that as the Russians were Christian, uh, the um, defeating the Ottomans would be in their favor. So they began, they began to be recognized as a fifth column and they were cleared out of Eastern uh, Anatolia. One of the things that made me really look at this question again was, there's no denying that there was a genocide. But my question was, well, how come there were so many Armenians in Istanbul? How many, so many were saved and allowed to be saved once they got to Aleppo um, or if they went south, you know, so that it was um, regional. It wasn't empire wide, if I can put it that way. And that I think is part of the nature of the kind of cosmopolitanism of, um, of the Ottoman empire in this late period. I mean, no denying that these uh, these forced migrations occurred, but they were uh, kind of a byproduct and uh, of uh, of uh, of earlier conflicts, if I can put it that way. Um, and um, yeah, so yes, the Armenians did not receive land; they were mainly uh, urban. The Assyrians did not receive land either, in the same way that the Circassians did. But with the Circassians, we're talking about close to 4 million. With the Armenians, because half of them died, we're only perhaps talking about 750,000. Um, and those are really big numbers. So you can, you can understand how this refugee code got established for these groups. Um, but for some of the, the uh, autochthonous groups, um, they, they didn't receive that same kind of support, but because of the structure of the millet, they had communities that where they could find sanctuary within the empire, if, if that makes any sense. Thank you very much. I wonder if we can pick, uh, uh, we have Dino saying thank you. Uh, writing, thank you. We uh, is it okay to accept another question from the floor? Okay, sure. so we have Bashak Gümünse. Um, thank you, Professor. My question is on the missionary activities in the Ottoman geography. So the, the time periods when the Circassians were relocated in the Balkans and later in Anatolia and the Middle East were a period when the Protestant and Protestant and Catholic missionary activities peaked in these geographies. So I mean, can I claim that? the Circassians are being used as a counterforce in these geographies, like at this point. Actually, you know, that's a very good point. That's very, very possible because uh, this late period of the Ottoman um, was really problematic. You know, the most of this missionary activity um, uh, also kind of came in under this very broad concept of the capitulations. So that France very early on had the capitulation to look after Catholics, um, which was um, uh, initially meant to be, you know, that Catholics uh, uh, of the Ottoman Empire wouldn't have to pay tax, uh, you know, uh, they could use the, the court of France, et cetera, et cetera. But very rapidly, it became a much wider. So it became um, a not only trade, you know, special trade, um, uh, favored nation status under in terms of trade, uh, but also they began setting up schools. Uh, and this is also where a lot of the ideas of nationalism began to emerge. So you had the French Catholics, you had Germans, you had huge American missionary efforts that was also taking place. And what the what's quite interesting is the American Protestant missionary uh, effort. What they found is that their, mo their biggest successes were with Armenians. 
not necessarily with uh, the Catholics or whatever, but the Armenians, the Apostolic Church. Uh, and that's why eventually we had a Protestant um, uh, Armenian millet as well as the uh, Apostolic and the Catherine. Uh, Catholic. So, yes, I, you know, I think um, they were very concerned about the activity of the missionaries, the kind of education, and the way also that these ideas of nationalism were coming across. So, I hadn't, I hadn't considered that, but I think that's a, that's an excellent point. Maybe you're writing about it. No, I don't. But thank you, thank you for that. Oh, okay. So, uh, Professor Chatting, may may we give space just for the last two questions, perhaps something quick? Okay, sure. Okay, great. So, I would like to invite Dima Meikari, who is actually also one of our uh, uh, next lecturer for the series. Hi, Dima. Hi. I'm um, actually half Circassian from my mother's side. I'm from Syria. And I've written about the Circassian culture, and that's what I'm going to be talking about in my lecture as well. Uh, I have one question for you because uh, you did talk about Tanzimat, but I, as far as I've read and I, I researched, that the idea of where Circassian were located was not 100% their choice. The reason why they were next to Bedouin all the time and mainly where the nomadic culture existed, it was because of the utilization of, uh, of that Tanzimat um, uh, legislation because they wanted to start taxing the people who are living there and they wanted to force their hand into register as, as owners of the land because nomadic culture did not want to register any, any ownership. They had an oral a tradition of who owns what. And the idea of having situations where they were was to force that. So I just want to, I don't know if you have more more, more uh, knowledge of that, sure. if you want to elaborate. Yeah, yeah. no, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, they, um, they, were, uh, they were offering state land to the Circassians and most of the state land was in the area of the Mamura which because of the Bedouin um, uh, using it for pasture land um, was, could not be taxed in the same way when you have the tax farming. So it was really important for them to transform the Circassians into farmers, um, which they did and they were very successful. And they also, not only did they stop a lot of the fighting uh, between the Bedouin and the Kurds and the Druze, but the, they also prompted some of the Bedouin, like the Al Fadl in the Jolan, from deciding to register the land themselves and have some of the Bedouin become farmers and pastoralists, agro pastoralists, because the, some of the Bedouin were seeing, well, our, all the pasture land is going to be disappeared, you know, if it all goes to the association. So it was the beginning of a lot of the land registration by the Bedouin uh, under a very feudal system because it was the it was the Shiuch who were then registering the land. Yes, I mean, um, there was some choice, like, you know, they didn't have to necessarily stay in Hamsa or Hama. They could continue down. And then, you know, the Sultan gave them all of the land in the Ghuta, in the Merj area, uh, uh, and uh, which was actually hit, hit where he used to graze his horses. Um, so it wasn't even um, the... Uh, what, I, what I call the state land, um, but and also some of the, the Mawat land that was also then uh, being registered. Of course, it was to revive the economy. Uh, it was to collect taxes. Uh, it was, in, you know, as I said, it was instrumental. It was to stop this fighting, which meant that even, uh, because what I should say, because somebody asked about Palestine, the, the, um, as the, the Palestinians were also encouraged to move down and to farm in some of the lowlands uh, during this time between the 1860s and 1880s. So it wasn't just Circassians that were being encouraged. Uh, and this was all in order to, you know, to have a more viable economy. I, I, I'm, you know, I'm not a historian, so I haven't really dug back to find out why this area was underpopulated in the way that it was. Um, but really for the 100, 150 years before, um, the suggestion, the records tend to show that um, uh, there was a lot of land that uh, was not exploited, but that could have been. I don't know what the reasons were. Uh, drought, uh, 
disease, plague, the Wahhabi <laughs> incursions from Saudi Arabia, you know. So, no, no, I think your point is is very good. So, uh, there was a little bit element of choice, but they were, you know, being directed to where the Ottomans found, thought they could be the most useful. Okay, thank you very much. We will close with one last question from our side, just in green okay. team. Yeah. yeah, thank you, Shatia. And uh, actually, it was very inspiring. And uh, actually, you triggered too many questions in my head, but I will just um, ask one question now. So um, it's interesting to understand the, the, um, the perspective of the uh, Ottoman authorities and uh, the immigration code and what they did uh, legally. But uh, what about the locals? About a local population in Palestine, in Jordan, and in, in, in Bilad al-Sham in general. And can we relate this uh, influx of um, multi-ethnic migration with the establishment or the um, formation of the Arab nationalist movement? Um, this is really a tough question, you know, because um, there was a movement for a sense of unity for Bilad al-Sham, for the kingdom that was promised under the uh, McMahon agreements. Now, using the term Arab becomes problematic. Although, having said that, many of the Armenians who I interviewed in Damascus, for example, um, would say, we're Armenian and we're Syrian. So I didn't say, dare say, are you Arab? You know, because what's the point? Because how are you going to define an Arab? Is it the language that you speak? Or is it a political sense of unity? But what I think was really clear is that there was a desire to be, for Bilad al-Sham to be um, a whole unit. Um, and I think that the, uh, the, the son of, um, the Sharif of Mecca, you know, of uh, Amir uh, Faisal, really wanted to do that. And when he was um, uh, thrown out uh, and sent to Iraq to be create a kingdom of Iraq, there was a real movement that, look, we don't want this. We want to be a nation. We want self-determination. Uh, this was the outcome of the King Crane Commission. And this was, you know, colonialism won out. But when the French tried to then separate, because I, I didn't talk about that at all, but in 1920, when they took over, they tried to separate greater Syria into uh, a Christian state, Lebanon, an Alawite state to the north, um, a Alexandretta, uh, a, a Halab, Dimashk, the Druze, and the Bedou. Starting from Jebel Druze was the Arab revolt. And, and we call it the Arab revolt, but it was started by a Druze. And the revolt was, no, we want to be one. So whether you want to call it an, uh, you know, Arab nationalism, uh, you can, but it includes Christians, it includes Muslims, it included at that time, the, the Alawites were even asked if they wanted to be separate and they said no. Um, but whether you call it a unity that is a greater Syria or Arab, I have to leave that to the politicians. Uh, but there was definitely a sense that we are one people. Even in 2011, you could see some of the slogans that, you know, Wahde, we are one, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. So I think we really, really took advantage of every single each minute. Thank you very much for your generosity. It was amazing.